Please welcome from, welcome to Night Vale, Cecil Baldwin. Hi everybody. Welcome back from the weekend. Uh, I want to say just thank you so much for the opportunity to get to come and speak to you. Uh, this is such a cool thing. Uh, you all have a cool job and I have a cool job and I'm glad we get to do that together today. <laughs> um, so I, I just want to give you like a little bit of a background about who I am and, and what I do and, and this crazy, crazy job that I have somehow found myself in. Um, so my name is Cecil Baldwin, and I am an actor. Uh, I, am a, I, I did mostly um, theater, classical theater, a little bit of voiceover stuff here and there. And then, uh, then in like my late 20s, I got in with this theater company called um, the New York Neo Futurists. And the New York Neo Futurists, uh, I, I went to school out in the Midwest. Uh, and it, th their flagship show, Too Much Light Makes the Baby Go Blind, had run for like 25 years in Chicago. And it was like the hallmark of sort of late night theater. Like the more you drink, the better we are kind of theater, <laughs> you know. Um, and, but it became this cult phenomenon out in Chicago. And then eventually some people came to New York and they started the New York Company. Uh, I went to school out in the Midwest and so I kind of, my college years were filled with kind of road tripping up to Chicago and seeing a normal play at eight, you know, and then go see like too much light at, you know, 1130 or whatever it is. Uh, and then eventually when I made my way to New York, I found out, oh, there's a New York company and I auditioned and didn't get cast. Uh, and then I auditioned again and got cast. Um, but what's so funny is that this theater company, the Neo Futurists, is like integral to the story of Night Vale. Um, because one of the writers is an actor, is a company member. Uh, the uh, Joseph Fink, the guy who sort of his brainchild Night Vale is, uh, is a huge fan of the show and saw Too Much Light over and over and over again. Um, and then I got involved directly because of Too Much Light. Uh, so the whole hallmark, hallmark of the neo futurists is you are who you are, you are where you are, and you are doing what you're doing. Uh, it was kind of in reaction to the sort of improv, you know, like uh, improv comedy scene of like the 80s in Chicago. Uh, and the idea is like, you know, okay, we'll just improv a scene where I'm the Queen of England and you're William Shakespeare and we'll just see where the funny is. And, and the neos want to get rid of all that and just be like, no, I'm Cecil, I'm, I'm always me. Uh, you know, I'm standing in this room, we're in New York City, I'm at the Google building, like, these are the given of the situation. And let's start from there and see what we can get into. Um, so how does all this apply to Night Vale? Uh, if, if you've ever listened to Night Vale, you'll notice that my character's name, coincidentally enough, is Cecil. Uh, and, and it was one of those things where when we first started, we're like, well, the character needs a name, I guess we'll just call it Cecil, right? It's your name, it's easy to remember, right? Uh, late, little did we know that would like later cause some consternation down, down the line. Uh, so uh, meet Joseph, Jeffrey, uh, the two writers, myself. Uh, we kind of had this idea to, Joseph loves podcasts and he was this sort of frustrated writer trying to, you know, like make it in the sort of writing publishing world uh, and was frustrated with like the amount of gatekeepers that are necessary to get published. Uh, he published his own book. I think he used like software design for creating greeting cards in order to do that. But it was just, you know, what he had available. And he was working as like selling green energy on the street and like putting together his books, as, you know. Uh, but he loved podcasts and he thought, well, this is like literally the lowest gatekeeper to get your stuff out there. So he had this idea of a small desert town where every conspiracy theory you've ever heard is not only true, but it's just a part of everyday life. Um, he got Jeffrey Craner on board, who is a neo-futurist as well. Um, and then I was currently doing a, a little short play with the neos uh, about how ever since I was a kid, I had this like sort of radio announcer voice. Um, and, uh, and, and somehow uh, I had yet to be on the radio, you know, uh, so, so 
Joseph heard this and was like, well, you know, I'm making this project that, you know, needs this sort of, uh, you know, this sort of guy who's like a NPR public radio character, uh, and you'd be perfect for that, but in the creepiest, weirdest possible way. <laughs> um, and, and I read the script, I read the pilot script, and I absolutely loved it. Uh, I'm a huge fan of David Lynch and David Cronenberg and, you know, uh, H.P. Lovecraft and, you know, like all these sort of horror tropes that were sort of built into the world of Night Vale, uh, but then kind of takes them and turns them on their head and then makes them interesting or abstract or funny. Uh, so I kind of immediately got the tone right away. Um, so we just started making this thing. I literally recorded it in my apartment in Harlem. Uh, would have to turn off all the air conditioners and like shut everything down and unplug the fridge so it didn't make any noise. Uh, <clears throat> I have to do take after take after take because you know I'd be in the middle of a dramatic monologue and then all of a sudden the ice cream truck would roll by. You know, <laughs> uh, there was an episode called uh, Yellow Helicopters and there were literally helicopters circling my apartment while I was recording, which sounds cute until it's like hour three and you're like, okay, I just need to finish this. I just need to finish this one episode. So we just started making this thing and, and we had no idea where it would go. Um, and then what was interesting about this idea of going back to these ideas of you are who you are, you are where you are, you're doing what you're doing. Um, I started incorporating uh, my own personality into the performance. Um, I record by myself. Uh, I'm kind of my own director so I do a take and then I go back and listen so I can like use my actor brain finish that and then go back and use my director brain because you can't do both at the same time, right? You can't do the thing and also comment on the thing while you're doing it. Like, it, you know, you really have to like separate those out. Um, but as Night Vale started to grow and as the plot got more developed and as like the world got more developed, all of a sudden uh, aspects of my own personality started to bleed into the world of Night Vale. Um, Early on, uh, this character, Carlos the Scientist, was introduced. And this character was really just a foil for the town of Night Vale. Uh, you know, Night Vale's this crazy place where, you know, pterodactyls appear suddenly in a PTA meeting and then disappear just as suddenly. But, you know, from my point of view as an actor, trying to ground that in a realistic human place was the most important thing. Um, so this character, Carlos the Scientist, shows up, uh, who's very normal, and he's like, you know, your town is really messed up, right? Let me, let me explain to you all the ways your town is messed up. But he was described as being this sort of gorgeous hair and gorgeous teeth and, you know, really, you know, just like shockingly beautiful. And, and so the first time I read that, my initial reaction is, okay, I live, you know, let's just say I live in a town with... 300 people and this like beautiful male model shows up, I'd at least be intrigued. And at the very most, I'd be like, okay, this guy's really cute. Um, and so I started putting more of that energy into my performance in uh, making you know, this relationship develop. And eventually, the writers picked up on that and all of a sudden we had this uh, canon gay relationship at the heart of the show that doesn't drive the show, but is nevertheless like an important uh, part of my character, the, you know, the sort of the voice <laughs> that talks to you all. Uh, and then over the, you know, over the course of the show, this sort of Cecil Carlos relationship actually became one of the linchpins that led to our success. Um, one of my favorite things about the show is that there are very few physical character descriptions. And this is really interesting and very, um, it's, it's very unusual these days. Uh, I remember the, so, there's so many popular sort of novels and, you know, stories and things like that. And it's all about what the characters are wearing and how, you know, how they, you know, uh, present themselves to the outside world. But in Night Vale, you have a lot of people's actions define who they are. Um, so this character is Tamika Flynn. Uh, she is a, a young teenager who um, is a militia leader, <laughs> of course, and really, really loves books and hates librarians. Now, uh, th this is classic Night Vale in that the mundane becomes absurd and the absurd becomes mundane. So something is 
usual as a librarian. All of a sudden in the world of Night Vale, librarians are these mythical beasts that want nothing more than to eat people that love books. Uh, so this character, Tamika Flynn, her, she's made it her job to protect Night Vale from the librarians. Um, but this incorporation of uh, people who are outside of the normal of what you might see in everyday media. Um, actually, I was just listening to the uh, Google talk with Aisha Tyler, and you know what's so interesting is that you know this is what ten years ago or so, and you know here's this woman, this black woman who was literally the first black person on Friends, you know, and and I think that kind of set the tone for like what is mainstream media doing and how are they reflecting the world that we live in, and being on the sort of cult end of things where we don't have corporate sponsors, we don't have a team of people looking over our demographics and going, oh, well, you know, if you write this person on, if you write a gay character into the show, you'll get this demographic, that demographic. Um, I, what's great is that we just do it. We just kind of put it out there and let it roll. So Tamika is this sort of strong, femi you know, like strong feminist character, uh, person of color who is, you know, kicking ass and taking names, and that is, you know, her, her, uh, you know, the color of her skin, the, her sexuality, things like that, are the least important thing about her, and yet they're still present. Uh, and Night Vale is rife with these; they're all over the place. Um, of course, in Night Vale, uh, angels exist. Um, and of course, uh, so this is another representation of my character, Cecil. Uh, as you can tell, looks nothing like me. But you know what? That's the joy of doing a radio show, is that these characters really exist in the listener's mind. Um, when Night Vale's first started to become popular, there was a huge debate over what does Cecil look like? And I find this really interesting because people want to be given the answers. They, they don't want to like sit and think and analyze for themselves, or if they do, they kind of want the creators to step in and be like, oh, you are correct. Yes, you are correct, correct answer. Um, and Night Vale, like, the answers aren't that easy. Um, if you look up any of the fan arts, uh, there's huge variations in what this character Cecil looks like, and he's never actually been described. Um, and, and what's really fascinating is that, you know, the they range everything from kind of the sort of Tim Gunn, blonde, mad men looking person to a uh, person of color, like Afro-Caribbean, you know, centric clothing to furry pants and like crazy fashion to uh, alien to there's a slug one there. I mean, like it really just, it runs the gamut. And whenever people ask me, they're like, what does Cecil look like? We need to know. And I'm like, well, what do you think he looks like? That answer is correct. And I think living in that ambiguity is one of the most beautiful things about Night Vale. You know, we live in this world now where, um, you know, media is omnipresent. I mean, you all work at Google, you know this. Like, it's everywhere. We have, we have tiny hand computers that live in our pockets all the time, and we have access to that information all the time. And that is amazing, but at the same time, living with a little bit of ambiguity in your life can actually make things kind of fun and interesting. So we continued to make Night Vale, and we got very, uh, very popular, very quick, uh, through uh, a mix of Twitter and Tumblr and Reddit, and, and there was like kind of this one perfect summer where Hannibal was on hiatus, and uh, Pacific Rim had just come out, and the nerds were like feeling really strong. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this weird podcast that you know had like a, a good amount of listeners, but nothing crazy, all of a sudden literally turned into the blueprint of what it means to go viral. Um, and you know, and and the interconnectedness of the world let this happen. So you have a fan of Night Vale who lives in Australia, and they tell ten of their friends about this podcast, and those ten people tell their friends, and et cetera, et cetera. But the difference is, is that those people can live all over the world and have a conversation just like we're having in this room. Um, and then it literally just happened in one summer. I was visiting a friend. Uh, I had been fired from my job uh, as a waiter, literally just around the corner here on 10th Avenue. Um, and I think I had enough money in my bank account to last three months. And I was like, OK, I'm going to have a great summer and just keep it low key and then find another waiter job like you do. Uh, and then over the course of that three months, 
Night Vale started to become this thing and our download numbers became more and more and more. And then we surpassed This American Life as like the most downloaded podcast in the world. Um, and then we became the most downloaded podcast in England. And then we, be, you know, and it, uh, in Australia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, me, Meg Bashwinner, Joseph Fink, Jeffrey Craner kind of looked at each other and went, I think there's something, like there's a sea change happening and we could all feel it. But we didn't quite know what it meant. Um, and so we just kept making the work. You know, we just kept, you know, we have this sort of, you know, new episodes every two weeks. We got to just keep putting it out there and just kind of let the noise happen and acknowledge it, but then just funnel everything into the work. And then eventually we did our first live reading and that was in San Francisco uh, at a bookstore called uh, The Booksmith in the Haight-Ashbury district. And we were like, oh, it'll be great. Well, you know, our, our friend Mara Wilson is there and, you know, she is the faceless old woman who secretly lives in your home and, you know, she's visiting her friend and, you know, we'll just, we'll just have like a fun little reading. We show up and there's hundreds of people there. And, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, as an actor, you know, you get on stage and you expect, you know, to like interact with people. But it's one thing to interact with 10, 15, 20 people and then interact with like 500. So this was very unexpected. Uh, but eventually we stopped pinching ourselves and then we're just like, you know what, this is just like doing too much light makes the baby go blind in the East Village at 11 o'clock at night. You just talk to the people, do the thing, make the art, and you know, like that's your job and it doesn't matter who's in the audience or how many people. Um, but eventually it did start to snowball and we were like, okay, well let's, you know, we're theater writers and actors, let's see if we can put together a live show. Uh, and so that sort of started us on like the next part of the journey of Night Vale, which is getting off of the podcast and then getting it into the live shows. Um, and we've done live shows all over the world at this point. Uh, we've performed in churches, we've performed in rock clubs, we've performed in uh, concert halls, uh, we've performed in theater theaters, in movie theaters. We've, you know, we've kind of run the gamut because it all started off as this very cottage industry, literally Jeffrey Craner calling up universities and be like, hey, can we rent out your, your lecture hall to do this show? And they'd be like, no one's gonna come see this. Uh, and yeah, sure, whatever. And we would, you know, do the show and then like hundreds of people would show up and, you know, these people were just like, what is going on? Um, and then, you know, over the, you know, we've had to like learn a lot about this. And I think this is a really interesting model for a lot of businesses that are happening right now where you do this thing that you love. Right, and then you keep doing it, and you do it because you love it, and you put it out there because you want to share it with the world. And then eventually, other people who love this thing also find it, and then they tell their friends, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But all the stuff that comes with that is the tricky part. So, you know, we're theater actors, theater writers, you know, none of us had ever, I don't know, uh, put together a concert film or had to deal with writers, with, uh, uh, with, with um, agents and things like that. Like this was all kind of new. So our learning curve was very steep. And we found ourselves uh, reaching out to other people in the podcast community who were a little bit farther along than us. And that has been invaluable. So this is actually from one of our first live shows. Uh, so that's me in the middle. Uh, Mara Wilson is right above me, who's this amazing actor, um, you know, very famous as a child actor, but now is like a writer, a uh, serious writer, um, and, you know, like Twitter personality. Um, Next to her is uh, Jackson Public, who is the voice of uh, and creator of uh, Venture Brothers. Um, next to me is uh, Mark Evan Jackson, who is like literally one of the best improv people in the world. Um, and you've seen him in a million TV shows and movies and things like that. But uh, him and then down in the corner, I think that's Mark Gagliardi, who is uh, someone who I know from growing up, who is also an improv sketch comedy person. And uh, Mark and uh, Mark and Mark, um, worked for the Thrilling Adventure Hour, which is kind of this long-standing, uh, old-school Hollywood radio show. Very, very funny, very sketch-oriented, and they had this huge roster of celebrities that would be on their show, because it's just so much fun. But the Thrilling Adventure Hour team kind of reached out to us and was like, hey, this is how we do our live shows. 
take what you want. You know, listen, we have all these people in LA. If you ever want, you know, funny actors to come on your show, and we're like, yes, we will, absolutely. <clears throat> so we just asked them to come on the show, and all of a sudden we went from, you know, doing readings in bookstores. You know, with just like one or two people, Joseph's in the back playing, you know, music off of his iPod, you know, and then all of a sudden we have multiple mics and now we're doing like, you know, staging and, you know, where's the green room? Is there a bathroom in the green room? You know, what do we do with 12 actors while they're waiting off stage? Everybody has to eat. Who's ordered pizza? All of these logistical questions that you don't really think of when you're just doing it for the fun of it, all of a sudden start to come into play. Uh, it was a really fun night. We did two shows that night, and the show was, I don't know, like two hours long. So you imagine like four hours of standing on stage telling a story. Uh, and it, when you're on stage, time gets kind of weird. Uh, you know, it can either like feel like forever or it can be the blink of an eye. Um, and that night was definitely one of those nights where uh, it was eight o'clock and then all of a sudden I blinked and all, it's one in the morning. And I was like, I don't know where that night went, uh, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, so this is a uh, more recent picture. This is uh, Dylan Marin as uh, Carlos uh, and myself. Uh, going back to this idea that this sort of gay can canonical relationship is at the heart of the show. Um, and Dylan is one of the kindest, funniest, uh, smartest actors I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Um, and, and this sort of relationship at the heart of the show, I think, was kind of a, a, a linchpin for the popularity of Night Vale. Because it was something that, no matter where in the world you lived, you know, you have your physical community, the people that you see every day in your school, your family, things like that. Those are the people that you interact with. But then you also have your kind of chosen community, uh, which for a lot of people online, that can be a way for gay people to connect with other gay people, for, you know, vegetarians to connect with other vegetarians, whatever it is that you, you define your community as being. And I think having this transparent and very real, honest look at a gay relationship kind of opened a lot of people's eyes to what a gay relationship is. And you know what? It's pretty much the same as a straight relationship, you know? Uh, and Night Vale kind of made its point on focusing on um, who's gonna do the dishes, who's gonna cook dinner that night. It's the mundane stuff that makes uh, people's minds change because you're a listener and you're like, oh, well, I'm not gay, but this sounds exactly like my relationship. Um, and, and incorporating that into the show has done nothing but like make it, uh, bringing allies on and like changing people's minds. So there is this sort of social justice warrior aspect of the show that is uh, not only um, like unapologetic, but is also kind of necessary, you know, and especially in the last few years, it's been really, really beneficial. Uh, so let's see, um, you know, like I said, we've had some really amazing times getting to tour all over the world. And uh, this was uh, Will Wheaton as a character on our show. Uh, um, what's interesting about doing a show that is ongoing and episodic and epic is that uh, you always get a chance to kind of change things as you go. You know, so the characters in episode 10 are not the same characters that are in episode 100, right? Like a lot of backstory has been drawn out. And because you know two weeks, you'll, you know, you gotta, you gotta feed the podcast. You know, the podcast will keep on coming out. So it gives you a chance to world build and it gives you a chance to go off on tangents and explore little cul-de-sacs and then maybe get back to the main plot and then go off on another tangent. And this episode is just a monologue from a totally different character, and that's okay. Because again, you're the boss. Like when you're creating this, when you're sort of the creator of something like this, you don't have anyone to answer to, and you can follow those things that you find interesting. And chances are your audience will find them interesting as well. So Will's character was really interesting because it was I want to say he started off as just kind of like a one-off joke where he was, you know, a childhood friend of Cecil's uh, and then there was possibly some romantic interest. But it was very, you know, subtext, sub, sub, subtext. Um, and then, you know, the internet exploded and they were like, don't you mess with Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this interloper trying to hoard in on in our favorite gay relationship? 
And the writers, you know, being who they are, they're like, okay, I see what the, the audience thinks. You know, we're going to go the totally opposite direction. So he becomes this, like, childhood friend of Cecil who, you know, just kind of builds backstory. Uh, and Will's character is a chef at a very trendy, trendy restaurant in Nightville called Tourniquet. Uh, and he's always coming on to the show and doing cooking segments um, that are just, like, the most horrific things you've ever heard in your entire life. Um, and, you know, Will is, like, the nicest person, and he's so down to earth and you know again it's like he got the sense of humor um, you know being like one of these sort of king of the nerds that are out there in the world you know um, but it just it made it really interesting because not only is that relationship between creator and um, listener uh, it's it's reflexive you know like we make something and then we send it out into the world and the world reacts to it and then we react to that reaction. Um, again, one of the reasons why technology can really help because all of a sudden that is instantaneous. Um, and then I think Will's character is like a definite, uh, it shows how that can flourish and progress. So let's see. Uh, this is uh, Joseph Fink in the middle, uh, the creator of Welcome to Night Vale, Symphony Sanders, uh, who's a dear friend of mine who voices Tamika Flynn. Uh, and then Aaron McYone uh, down on the side there. One of the interesting things about Night Vale is that every episode includes uh, a song by an independent musical artist. Um, and these range from, you know, hip hop to folk to uh, pop to anything, as long as it falls squarely in the musicians just trying to get their work out there. And Aaron McYone is this amazing musician who is kind of a, um, uh, like an Ani DeFranco protege back in the day, uh, and then has just continued to make her own music for, for years. And we found her, we snatched her up, because she's awesome, she makes great music, she's a lot of fun to tour with, very important, um, and also brings like a really great energy to the show. Um, you know, it's so funny, like when you are at work, the people around you really define the quality of the work. And you want to find people that, that challenge you, that support you, and also like help you think differently than you already think, but also know how you think. Um, so that way, uh, somebody you know, gives you an idea and you're like, I never in a million years would I have thought about that, but I love it and now here's what I can add to it. Uh, the relationship between the writers and myself, the other actors that appear on the show, uh, we all have this sort of working relationship. Um, and it's really great because we get to go and do this show live uh, in front of hundreds of people and every night is a little bit different because that's live theater. Uh, so Sophie and I are constantly refining and uh, working on the comedy of the show. And we're like, okay, this joke didn't work tonight. Maybe if we try it this way. Okay, it worked a little bit better. Okay, let's try adding this. Let's try doing this. And so every night is a little bit of an experiment. And again, going back to this idea of like a little bit of ambiguity can, is actually okay. Like a little bit of an experiment is okay. You know, you get out there and you know the work is solid. You know what you're doing. But around the periphery, you can also kind of play around a little bit. Uh, and that's, sometimes that's where the magic lives. Because you'll find things that your conscious brain never in a million years would have thought of. But all of a sudden when you're live in front of a group of people and you do something, you react honestly, you look at a person in the eye and you react using the language that you've been given, all of a sudden magic happens. Uh, so this is John Bernstein, AKA Disparition, uh, who has also been in on the, the show, Night Vale, uh, since the ground floor. Uh, Joseph knew John from way back in the day. I think he worked at Something Awful, if you remember that, yeah. Um, they, they worked there together. Uh, and John is this brilliant musician who makes uh, the most beautiful, like, ambient music you've ever heard. Uh, and he had, like, just a whole canon of music that he put out into the internet for free. Joseph said, hey, do you mind if I use some of your music as background for Night Vale? Um, and John was like, yeah, sure, I don't know, you know it's just sitting there. Um, so, so we started incorporating his music into the show, and then eventually, once the show started taking off, John started writing specifically for Night Vale. And now, he tours with us, and he plays uh, live. He live underscores the entire show, and that he plays mandolin, he has, you know, a keyboard, he has, like, all the sort of tech wizardry that happens over here in the corner, you know, while I'm, while I'm talking into a microphone. And what's great about this is 
it just incorporates another layer of look, here are people, here are a group of artists, actors, writers, musicians, who are doing what they love to do. And you love to watch them do it. And we're gonna like just sit in a room, it's the simplest, oldest formula in the world, storytellers telling a story, musicians playing music, and people listening. That's all you need. When I was, when I was back in theater school, um, a teacher asked us to define theater. And you know, we're like, oh, it's gotta be you know, Broadway, it's gotta be this. She's like, no, nope, think simpler. Um, and eventually we got it down to A performs B for C. That's it, that's, that's the only formula that you need for theater and storytelling. You need people to perform, you need what they're performing, and you need someone to listen. Um, and so we have created this um, theater troupe essentially, like a theater troupe in the older sense, like the Elizabethan sense of, you know, we act, we set up, we do, uh, we do our own green room, we drive from place to place, we, you know, we kind of handle not only the artistic side, but also the business side of stuff as well. Um, and I find that that's getting rarer and rarer these days um, because it's a lot of work. And it you know, requires a lot of attention to detail and it involves expanding your skill set all the time to incorporate things that you might not be totally comfortable with. Um, but you know what? There's nothing better than learning on your feet. So this is uh, one of my favorite venues. It's in uh, Vancouver. Uh, this was the end of one of the last tours. And you, know, you imagine going from doing a reading in a bookstore and then we're performing in uh, places like this you know, two, three years later. Um, and we've sold out this, uh, we, we've done almost sold out shows in this theater, this venue, I think three times now. Um, it's like the most beautiful theater in the world. It's like acoustically perfect. No microphones necessary. It's, it's one of my favorite places to play. Um, and it's also just this gorgeous, uh, Vancouver's amazing. So it's always fun to like have a stop there. Um, this is uh, another one of those venues that like, we just had to pinch ourselves that we were performing at. So this is uh, the Palladium in London. This is uh, the equivalent of you know, going uh, to the Nederlander Theater on Broadway. Um, it's this huge venue. Um, it's owned by Andrew Lloyd Webber. I mean, it's, you walk outside and you're in the middle of the heart of like, Oxford in London. Uh, uh, and it's, you know, like me and my friends were just like, I can't, like what? What did we do? How did we end up here? You know, and we're wandering around kind of like silently like walking through the crowd outside waiting to get into the show. And you know, most people don't recognize us when we're you know, just sort of average everyday people. And also London is filled with people so you can't really take it in. But we're just like, look at all these people. They're here for us. <laughs> Can you believe this? This is crazy. And the energy before that show was absolutely unbelievable because we're in a foreign country, we're, in, we're, we're outside of our comfort zone, we're outside of our home, and yet we still feel like we are at home because we're just doing what we love to do. And it's the same show that we had done 50, 60, 70 times before. And so there's a level of comfortability. But the electricity in the room was amazing because this is 2,400 people, which I think was the largest show Night Vale had ever done to date. And then this is what I look like after the show. <laughs> so Night Vale is really, uh, has been this blessing. Uh, it has been this very, very strange journey and one that I'm still on that allows me to come to Google and to say, yes, I'm gonna stand up in front of a room of people and tell you my story. Um, and hopefully there's some, something that you can take away from that. Um, if anything, I think the, the blessing of Night Vale is just keep doing what you're doing. Keep making the work. Um, when I had been fired from that restaurant, you know, five years ago, six years ago, um, and I had no idea what I was gonna do, uh, and I had no idea where the money was come from, the only thing that was never in doubt was, I'm not gonna quit. You know, I'm not gonna drop out and just be like, you know what, screw it, I'm, I'm done, I'm, I've had enough. I'm, you have to keep making the work that you love to do, uh, and then eventually that will, blossom into something that other people will pay you to do that will allow you to live your life and then focus on that work and then once that happens the groundwork is already set and you kind of are in the mindset to be like no this is my job this is what i love um i, I always say that to anyone who moves to new york city you know to be a uh, any work in the arts work in anything really um you work all day to make your rent, right? And then at the end of your day, you go home, and that's when the real work begins. 
that's when you start to work on the projects that really like feed your soul, that give you life. Um, and then if you're lucky and if you persist, then those projects eventually become the job that pay your rent. Um, and then all of a sudden you kind of marry those two. And I mean, that's what New York was made for. Um, I love what I do. I love it so much. And I love to be able to get to talk to people. Uh, and I welcome the chance to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Let's see. Let's find a good background slide. There we go. All right. <laughs> So yeah, we do encourage you guys to think of your questions and to make your way to the microphone for that. Um, we definitely want to hear from all of you. I do have a couple uh, yeah, to, get, yeah. to get us started, if that's OK. Uh, I wanted to talk uh, first about the horror okay. element of the show. I know, I know you spent a great deal of time talking about the comedy, mm. um, but I wanted to reference the horror part of it, because it, it very much is a horror story, or at least taking place in a, in a horror setting. Mm. But it's not like a contemporary horror. It's mm. not gory in any way. Yeah. It's not really filled with jump scares. So I was wondering if you could talk about the, the influence of the, the horror background in the setting. Sure. Well, I mean, it's, it was definitely present from the very beginning, like that pilot episode. And I think one of the reasons that I, uh, I was so fortunate to become part of this project is because I knew the guys. Like, I knew their voice. Like, I had heard their writing, and I had heard them speak their own writing. And so I knew what was funny and also what was scary. And, like, what, let's say if they had just had an audition and, you know, put it out in backstage, like, oh, we need a voiceover actor. I don't think another actor would have gotten to that that humor or that horror as quickly. Uh, because I read that pilot script, and I was like, oh, it's Twin Peaks. Oh, it's it's blue velvet. Sure, you know, sure. Uh, like okay, great. I know, like you know, how something that's very simple and mundane uh, can become very scary and unnerving. Uh, have you all seen Blue Velvet? Do you, all, you, you know, um, so Kyle MacLachlan's character in the first like ten minutes finds an ear, like <laughs> like just out in the grass, um, and it, and it's the idea of something very normal, something very simple that we see every day, literally thousands of times a day, but taken out of its context can become terrifying. And I think a lot of the horror of Night Vale is really based on that. So uh, something like uh, finding a cassette tape that you made when you were a teenager um, and sort of you know reveling in that nostalgia of like, oh, listen to how cute I was, little teenage me. But then at the end of that cassette tape, you die. <laughs> And you don't know what killed you or what happened, but you're definitely here now. And this is real, and I feel real. And, and it's all those questions in that. And I think that's where like, the scariness of Night Vale lies, is in that um, uh, unexplained phenomena. Sure, the unexplained is a, a really key element. And I think you guys do that a lot with mm. the, a lot of the characters. Like you were saying, leaving out detail. Right. Uh, to allow that to be filled in, mm. uh, it works in a very Twilight Zone, Outer Limits kind of way of just like there's clearly something going on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we're gonna let but your no brain put fill that all it. in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are there plans to start explaining? No. Any? Why? Why would there? <laughs> well, I mean, what's interesting is that the way Night Vale is structured is that um, uh, because it was very uh, homegrown in the beginning. Uh, it wasn't until like episode 10 or 15 that we're like, whoa, whoa, we should probably start recording and keeping track of some of these characters <laughs> and what they do and what they've done. And, and, uh, and so what's interesting about doing this episodic show is that a joke, like literally a one sentence joke from episode three, all of a sudden can turn into an entire plot line that takes over an entire season. Um, and, and that is our way of kind of going back and explaining things. Uh, so, you know, simple characters like Will Wheaton's character mm. uh, is, is a good example where it was just like a, one, a little one-off joke. Um, you know, Cecil was in Boy Scouts, and he was in Boy Scouts with this guy. And then all of a sudden, that goes off in a totally different tangent that now is taken that character relationship to a different place. Um, I think what's interesting is that uh, there are these sort of demigods in Night Vale, these sort mm -hmm. of strange, unexplained, um, powerful creatures. And I think 
if anything, Night Vale will probably start filling in the gaps in some of those. And some of that eldritch horror has to yeah, have yeah, day yeah, jobs. Yeah. Because what <laughs> makes the eldritch abomination so terrifying is that it is indescribable. Right. You know, and when you start to describe it, your brain scrambles and people go mad. And and the the unknowedness of that is is what makes it scary. Um, I would say like the scariest thing is what lies just beyond the uh, the circle of light from a from a campfire, mm -hmm. you know, and like kind of going back to that idea of like if I was to describe to you every aspect of the madman that has escaped from the insane asylum that's you know out there in the woods somewhere, uh, it doesn't. I'm feeding you that information and I'm giving it to you so that way you don't have to do the work of like what is this person? Yeah. What is he? It's much more terrifying to imagine that for yourself, to not know, and to to live in that not knowing. That's so much scarier. Yeah, the the, the unknown or the things that are foreign to us are, are typically the scariest things, mm -hmm. which, which leads me to another interesting point that I want to talk about, which is the, uh, this you touched a lot on the relationship that's mm -hmm. at the core of the story, and it's not really heav heavily handed mm -hmm. like you've done, uh, uh, like you've explained, but the uh, it's led you to a lot of activism in that mm -hmm. uh, LGBTQ space. Mm -hmm. um, talk, discuss those things. How 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 sure. do you use the vehicle of the show and just like the normalcy of it mm -hmm. to then turn to advocacy when you're outside the the space? Of the sure. Show? What's interesting is that. You know, Night Vale, for all of its craziness and scariness, is is uh, pretty PG. You know, like like crazy, terrible things happen. Don't get me wrong, um, but it's it's still kind of a family friendly show um, in in a lot of really like in a kind of weird sort of way, and it's very inclusive. And and I find that when I meet people at uh, fans at. at live shows and online and things like that, um, oftentimes it's multiple generations of people that have discovered the show. Um, because there is this uh, uh, sort of uh, LGBT aspect to it, um, my character, uh, Dylan's character, Carlos, there's, you know, uh, the, the angels are non-gendered beings, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's really interesting because a lot of young fans get into the show and then use Night Vale as a gateway to talk to their parents or their friends or you know coworkers or whatever on who they are and they're like okay look you know I know I just I'm 14 and I just came out of the closet and I have no idea what's happening to my emotions or my body uh, and I have to you know process all this information and talk to my parents about mm -hmm. it so here mom dad here's a podcast that like represents like how I feel about you know this whole thing. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's kind of strange in that it is such a bizarre show, but it is so based in normal human relationships, and mm. I think that's what makes it so relatable. Yeah, normalization is huge. I think uh, in in all forms of advocacy, mm. anytime it's because it's that unfamiliarity that makes it scary. Oh, or, sure, yeah. Or the misinformation. So I I love that element of it. Yeah. We we got a couple questions. Great. Great. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, you're have these amazing live shows that you do. do you, now that the show is as popular as it is, do you uh, write and craft and rehearse privately and then like workshop it live and then go record it for the public? Or, oh. Because um, you said you do like 40, 50, 60 sometimes performances mm -hmm. and you find these moments live mm -hmm. which in true theater. So. Do you, do you, does the episode recording come first and then live, or vice versa? Uh, so the live show is is separate from the uh, the podcast, right? Um, you know, the podcast comes out once every two weeks. It is you know the 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 boys write an episode, they sign off on it, they send it to me. Uh, I record it at home, uh, send it back to them, and they put it up online. Uh, the live shows were kind of made for to be separate for a couple reasons. Um, it acknowledges the fact that everyone's in the same room probably is the most fundamental thing. Again, back to this idea of you are who you are, you are where you are, you're doing what you're doing. If you're live on stage, you can't deny that. You know, and, and we have played around with a lot of ideas of, you know, like, oh, you're listening to a radio show, but we all know you're really in a theater in Vancouver on a Tuesday night. Um, it also allows people who are not super fans of the podcast to walk in and kind of get what's going on. 
um, you know, the, the story of the live shows, every year we do a different script and we run that show for a year and we try to tour to as many places as possible and get that live script to them. Um, and then we kind of finish it, we're like, great. And then we release that online. Uh, John Bernstein, um, he records pretty much every live show that we do. And then at the end of that yearly cycle, he'll take his kind of favorite moments, uh, each section by section, and then find, okay, well, you know, we had Desiree Birch was in Germany for this one show in Cologne, and that was the best me and Desiree have ever done. <laughs> so we're gonna take that recording and then put that together with Jeffrey did a monologue, you know, it's his character and, and Philly, Nailed it. So we're going to like cobble that together. And then that's what we release. Uh, I think we do like a suggested donation on Bandcamp of a dollar. Mm. You know, so it's really more about make the work, get it out there, rather than, you know, like let's commodify this to death. Um, and what's great about that is when you are in this mindset of like work, 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 you know, just get out there and do the thing, uh, it allows for these unexpected moments to pop up. Um, you know, we don't do improv, you know, it's a script, it's all scripted, like Joseph and Jeffrey have written the live performance script. But, you know, what you can't control in the moment is audience reactions, it's what you ate for dinner that night, it's all these sort of human elements that become like the sort of mystery factor. Um, and all of a sudden, Symphony Sanders will say something that will just, cr like, cracks me up. And you know you can either deny that moment and pretend like it never happened, you know, which a lot of mainstream theater is kind of built on, or you can allow it to happen, acknowledge it, and then kind of incorporate it into the performance. And if it's something that's truly amazing, you do it again the next night. But the trick is you can't recreate that mystery factor. You know, it has to be like real and organic. Um, or you go, you know what? That was hilarious. Tomorrow night, it won't be there because it won't feel real. So if you're riding that line between, you know, doing the best show possible, sticking to the script, but then also being open to external stimulus and uh, the truth of the moment. Thank you. Yeah. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, Hi. So awesome to have you here. Oh, thanks. Um, so um, you said that you uh, act as your own director when you're recording. Uh, but a uh, lot of the tone of Night Vale comes from the like, specificity of your voice and the way you say things. So I was wondering how much of this is uh, like stage directions in the script and how much of it is it's just you? Okay, that's a, that's a really great question because what's interesting is uh, there's no stage directions in the script. Like it is really, uh, there's, there's two books out now that are um, kind of the first year and the second year of Night Vale scripts. And if you look at those, there's like, maybe there's a door slam, maybe there's, uh, you know, shuffling papers, but that's it. So everything else is just words on a page. Um, my background, I did a lot of classical theater in my 20s, like a lot of Shakespeare, Moliere, things like that. And what's great about that training is that's exactly kind of how Shakespeare worked. Uh, the Elizabethans would go listen to a play. They wouldn't go to watch a play, you know, they, uh, kind of what we think about now. Um, they would, the, the actors would take this poetry and there'd be very little visual element. It's, you know, kind of basic. It was performed outside under full sunlight. There's, you know, people selling oranges and prostitutes and, you know, business, shady business deals and, you know, highbrow and lowbrow and everything in between. And it was kind of this carnival atmosphere. But a play was going on. And some of the most beautiful poetry in the world was being spoken. And the Elizabethans could pick up on that poetry uh, because they tuned in their ears to listen to it. Um, so I find when I'm at home in my, you know, in my living room recording an episode, I approach the language of Night Vale with the same reverence as I would to be or not to be, because that's all you have. You know, like right now, uh, I'm sitting in front of you, we're looking at each other, I'm using my hands to emphasize a point, and you know, we have these secondary gestures, secondary communication, um, and all that is kind of taken away when you do a radio show. So you have to take all of that and then focus it just on the words. Um, and I find that's the biggest trick. 
Uh, and you know, there are times when I'll record a segment and I'll go back and listen. I'm like, oh, it sounds a little flat, not because you know the the writing is flat or the performance is flat, just because it's not heightened enough. It's not intense enough, um, and you kind of have to like overshoot the mark with intensity. Um, you know, especially when there's no visual element to it. And you're talking about crazy things happening. You know, there's a woman who's visiting our town and she's taking over people's brains and making them say poetry uh, in, in a rhythmic chant. Like, you can't go too far, mm -hmm. you know? And oftentimes, the ideas that I have in the moment that are like, why did this character sound like this? I don't know. It sounded interesting at the time. Like, those are the most, like, those are the longest lasting ideas. Because you're just like, I don't know, I followed this down this rabbit hole, and that's where we are. Mm -hmm. And those are often the characters that people really love. Have you ever had that go uh, counter to what uh, the guys writing uh, thought, to yes. where they were like, oh, oh this absolutely. is meant to be a laugh line? And oh, absolutely. Um, I, I think there was one character, uh, Leanne Hart. She's, uh, she's a uh, blogger, I believe. No, she is a... Uh, local newspaper uh, editor, uh, and and you know, kind of her thing is that she hates bloggers, um, and she wants to kill them all with an axe. You know, <laughs> that's her thing. Um, and I was, you know, it's kind of like again, like a one-off character, and then eventually she got like an episode where she was very present, and she speaks. Um, and I was like, well, she seems to be kind of unhinged. Uh, and she gets more and more unhinged as the episode goes on. So what started off as a very normal sounding character all of a sudden turned into uh, like the Joker from Batman by the end of it. Um, you know, and she's just, she, you know, like she gets crazy. So I recorded the episode and I sent it off to Joseph and Jeffrey and they were like, okay, uh, yeah, Leanne is actually a character in like some upcoming episodes and she can't be like, totally batshit insane. Like we had like, you know, sort of like pull it back a little. And I was like, great, uh, that I can do. Like one of the easiest things in the world is to, to dial something down. Mm -hmm. It's much harder to, to increase it in intensity. Uh, so I find, you know, like start at a 10 and then start pulling it down. So like you kind of hit that sweet spot. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Please. Yeah, thanks. Hey, um, one of the most interesting uh, thanks to me about Night Vale is how it does sort of work to normalize like a vast swath of humanity mm. um, and it does it through horror. A lot of times in horror the other is used as something to fear, something mm. to project everything evil mm. against. Um, whereas in Night Vale, you know, to accept the premise of the show you have to understand that a severed hand from a Russian man is a teenage girl. Absolutely. Or yeah. that there are literally five-headed dragons yeah. <laughs> around. Yeah. And they're gonna and they're gonna run for a mayoral office, you yeah. know? Like because sure. what else would they do? So uh, could could you talk a little bit about that? Like <clears throat> how, how you turn horror around? Well I think what's interesting about Nightville is that at its heart it is about community. Like it's it's about this American town. Um, and, and, and what I love about Joseph and Jeffrey's writing is that it's not writing America as it is perceived by itself. You know, like, like things on TV, like you kind of think about, you know, like the, the, the nuclear family sitcom and like what that is. And, you know, is that real? Like, is that how we see ourselves or is that how a certain section of the population want to see ourselves? And I think Joseph and Jeffrey are much better at you know, incorporating everybody into mm. this community. So then it becomes the horror of what lies outside that community. Um, you know, like Cecil at his heart uh, is, loves the town of Night Vale. Um, and everyone in that community is uh, beloved by him, you know, because he sees the importance of this sort of interconnectedness of these communities that we live in. Uh, and so then the scary stuff comes from outside of that. Uh, if you notice kind of like a lot of the, the, to you know, borrow the Buffy term, the big bad, you know, like every, every season has the big bad, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's an outside corporation or it's an outside uh, town that is trying to take over Night Vale. It is, you know, um, 
someone who accidentally summons the devil in the form of you know uh, you know like it, it's you know it goes on and always like the big bad is always an outside thing that is like attacking the the fabric of what Night Vale is, which mm -hmm. is this accepting you know um, like uh, uh, community that supports each other even when you can't stand each other you still kind of know you're like yes this is my stepbrother his name is Steve Carlsberg and I hate him but he's still my stepbrother and so I love him you know yeah. and it's playing with that relationship so you know the people in Night Vale very rarely are the scary thing it's always something that's kind of like invading that um, and I think that does a lot to kind of remind people that no matter where you're at in your life uh, you know, the outside world is terrifying. Like, you know, literally pick up the news and just like look at Twitter and just be like, okay, what am I gonna be terrified of today? <laughs> um, but eventually you're gonna get through it. You know, and that's like the takeaway of Night Vale is like the scarier it gets, the more hopeful it gets. Um, because at the end of the episode, Cecil doesn't know where the next episode is gonna be, what, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow, but he's like, no, all I know is that this community has my back, and I am the voice of this community, um, and we move on from there. That's great. Yeah. That's great. They're they're all the frogs in the boiling water. Right. right so yeah, the yeah. glass of room temperature tap water is terrifying. Yeah. 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 That's exactly. Great. They're like, well, we've gotten used to this now. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. So, what's the one question you wish someone had asked you but never has? Oh man. <laughs> Just, the one question I wish somebody would ask me. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I do. I always love the question, like, "What is your dream project?" You know, it's very like I don't think anybody has ever asked me that, and it seems like very like kind of staple of like, if you could do anything, what would you do? Um, yeah, I think I think that's it. So okay, now <laughs> so if it's a dream question. Um, as a fan of horror movies and Shakespeare and like kind of all these sort of disparate things, um, has anybody ever seen this movie, uh, Theater of Blood? Do you know this movie at all? It's this like super campy Vincent Price, Diana Rigg movie um, in which Vincent Price uh, plays a Shakespearean actor who fakes his own death, uh, goes crazy, develops a theater company made of homeless people, and then exacts revenge on all the critics that panned him when he was a legit Shakespeare actor, Love and it. kills them in ways that are designated by the play he was in that they wrote bad reviews of. Uh, so he like, you know, he was Titus Andronicus, and so he takes the critic and like, you know, bakes their dogs into a pie, sure. like kind of thing. I've always wanted to do a remake of that film. Okay. So, you know, like if anybody has any ideas, writers, directors, please, please come see me. <laughs> because that is literally, like this incorporates everything in my brand, like everything yeah. that I get excited about. I did. That's my dream project. I did want to ask about, um, and, and this might be where we, where we wrap up. Thanks for your question. Mm -hmm. I, I did want to ask about the future of the, sort of the larger IP. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you guys have a, a wildly engaged audience. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the artwork that you showed was, was brought to you from yes from the subreddit, from mm -hmm. Tumblrs and, yeah, yeah. and the community. I wanted to ask about the future of the IP and what you guys might have planned uh, as far as expanding it, because it does seem mm -hmm. like you could go in a film kind of direction right. or in a television series kind of direction, maybe a, a role-playing game. Oh my god, yeah. The, like, the, the hardest part about it is um, there, there's no boundaries. You know, and, and like, you know, one of the things that we learned working with the Neo Futurists is that putting putting boundaries on things actually lets you be more creative. Like it, it defines your sandbox, right? You know, it like you're like this is the, these are the, these are the box of crayons, right? And you know, and it doesn't matter if you have five colors, if you have five thousand colors, like the what you can produce from that is infinite. Mm -hmm. You know, but you only have five to you know, like that's those are the parameters. And what's interesting about where Night Vale is heading next is we are limited by our own experiences and like what we know to do. Like, would I love to see like a Magic the Gathering style card game of Night Vale? Hell yes I would. <laughs> I would play that all day. Um, would I love to see a off-Broadway musical about Night Vale? Yeah, absolutely. But I can't write, I'm not a musical person. Like I can't, like there, I have a limited amount of knowledge in that area and so I can't just be like, you know what, I'm gonna write a musical. Um, it would take, a lot of work and a lot of years to get there. Um, 
I've never made a like you know line produced a TV show or you know been a showrunner or a TV show. So we're finding ourselves having to align ourselves with people that are um, as passionate about the project as we are. Uh, and is passionate about the integrity of the project and also have those skill sets. And that's, that's like, those things take time, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, they're definitely, uh, those people are definitely out there, but it's all about finding them. Kind of right. in the way that the Thrilling Adventure Hour people found us and we found them. It was like, oh, you, you get this, you know, because there's nothing worse than you know, I think everybody, like we're, everybody here is very savvy, you know, and you can tell when a project was made just for a cash grab. You know, when you're like, oh, okay, you know, we totally rebooted this thing one more time just so some people can make some money, but there's no like heart into it. And I think Night Vale is kind of the opposite of that in that we would rather do the work and feel passionate about it. And if it takes us 10 years to make a film, it took us 10 years to make a film. You know, if it takes us 20 years to make a card game, which seems a bit extreme, um, <laughs> but you know, that's how long it took. But you better believe that we all felt the best about it every step of the way. Yeah. Um, and I think that's like an unusual thing. Um, you know, people talk a lot about selling out and da 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 and this whole thing. And you know, there, there's like, it's not so black and white as all that. Like you, you just gotta make decisions based on the information that's in front of you, you know, and someday if, you know, like uh, these many things come to pass, that'd be amazing, but you want to do it right. You know, I think it's better to, to feel passionate about the work than it is to like just get it out there in order to just, you know, have it be out there, mm -hmm. you know, and pay your mortgage or whatever. Hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I, I think the fandom now has new marching orders. So for the next four months, you're going to get Night Vale, the Gathering Magic Great. cards to your inbox. <laughs> Let's do Thank it. Thank you, Cecil, so much Absolutely. for Thank taking you the so time much. to join us. Thank yes. you. Thank you for coming.